This conference will now be recorded. Welcome to Oceanside Library's virtual program, To Sleep Per Chance to Dream. Uh, tonight's program is sponsored by Assemblywoman Missy Miller and Northwell Health's Cat Katz Institute for Women's Health. Tonight's presenter is Dr. Penny Stern. Thank you so much, Dr. Stern, for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me and thank everybody for, for being here. I, I appreciate your presence here. So I'm going to be talking about sleep and people may ask, why do we sleep? Well, when you sleep, your body has a chance to repair and to regenerate and even your brain cleanses itself and, and helps refocus your mind. So if you're not getting enough sleep, that's risky behavior. When you don't sleep enough, your immune system doesn't work as efficiently. So at your increased risk of catching anything that's going around and in current day, we know what that might be. So let's talk a little bit about what's happening with our sleep. And for some reason it's frozen. Why is it frozen, the slide? Oh, there it goes. So um, today about 20% of Americans report that they get less than six hours of sleep on average. And the number of Americans that report they get eight hours or more has also decreased. Why do we care? Well, sleep deficits are linked to poor work performance, relationship problems, mood problems like anger and depression, as well as the immune system suppression I already mentioned. Um, and sleep loss is also a huge public safety hazard every day on the road. Drowsiness can slow reaction time as much as driving drunk. And the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration estimates that fatigue is a cause in 100,000 auto crashes and 1,550 crash-related deaths a year in the United States. There's a growing list of health risks that have been documented as being associated with poor sleep. Um, recent studies suggest that heart disease, diabetes, and obesity are all linked with chronic sleep loss. And how does this work? Well, we know that sleep deprivation increases heart risks. Why? Because inflammation is a well-known predictor of cardiovascular health. And now we have evidence that poor sleep appears to play a bigger role than we previously thought in increasing inflammation levels. Um, in one study, researchers found an association between poor sleep quality and women showing the biomarkers for inflammation associated with cardiovascular disease and stroke. And specifically, the study found that women who reported sleep deprivation, that sleeping less than six hours a night, had far more inflammation than men who slept the same amount. Um, researchers also were noting that slightly more women than men were likely to report altogether poor sleep. Uh, diabetes, sleep has long been thought of as a restorative process for the mind and the body, and many studies have shown that it also directly affects many metabolic and hormonal processes. So we know that the onset of deep sleep is associated with metabolic, hormonal, and neurophysiologic changes all of which can affect glucose balance. Glucose is sugar. Uh, the brain uses less glucose. The pituitary gland releases more growth hormone. The sympathetic nervous system is less active. And in view of all these, these changes in glucose metabolism during sleep, it's not surprising that getting less sleep or poor sleep on a regular basis could affect overall glucose balance. When it comes to weight, sleeping may actually help you lose weight. So if you snooze, you lose. Lack of sleep seems to be related to an increase in hunger and appetite, and then possibly to obesity. If you think about it, if you're not sleeping, you're often eating. So we think that sleeping is very, you know, it's lethargy, it's, it's slothfulness, it's wasting time. Well, actually, it's good for you to sleep in terms of body weight. Um, one study showed that people who sleep less than six hours um, a day were almost 30% more likely to become obese than those who slept seven to nine hours. Because really, as I said, when you're up, you're more likely to eat. So um, we know that there are hormones that do regulate appetite. And we know that shortened sleep time is associated with decreases in those hormones. So uh, this is important to think about. Sleeping 
is good for you in terms of weight. So complaints of, of sleep difficulty include things like less total nighttime sleep, more nighttime arousals and awakening. And for those people who wake up frequently at night, they know what I'm talking about. Early morning awakening. Um, we know that uh, people who want to wake up early in the morning are happy to get up with the birds, but people who prefer to be sleeping in the early morning don't appreciate getting up ultra early. So what kind of sleep problems do we see? Well, one is being forgetful. Um, researchers have determined that there are events in the brain called sharp wave ripples, and those sharp wave ripples are responsible for consolidating memory. And what is it these ripples actually do? They transfer learned information from the hippocampus to the neocortex of the brain, and that's where long-term memories are stored. And these ripples occur mostly during the deepest levels of sleep. So if you want to improve your memory, increase your sleep. Uh, typical symptoms of sleep problems include difficulty falling asleep, uh, less time spent in those deeper restorative stages of sleep, and of course, excessive daytime sleepiness. Now, if you don't sleep at night, you have to sleep sometime, and many people take naps during the day, which unfortunately, can disrupt the normal sleep-wake cycles, and then you end up with insomnia. I'm going to mention uh, the effect of caffeine, alcohol, and certain medications, which also can interfere with sleep in a minute. I'll talk about that more. And uh, I mentioned restless leg syndrome, which I'll also mention more about in a moment. So these are the kind of processes that may interfere with sleep and concurrently promote wakefulness. Anybody who has an acute or chronic um, illness will know that sleep can become impaired. Uh, acute illnesses, the good news is that if you are acutely ill, you will get better and it will go away. But chronically ill people know that their conditions are constant and so their sleep may always be disrupted. And we're going to talk more about these in a minute. There's the effects of medications. Again, more to come on this in, in a moment. Um, poor sleep habits or poor sleep hygiene is also key, and we'll go through these one by one. Neurological disorders such as Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease also can interfere with sleep, and of course, pain and discomfort from any source may delay sleep onset and also shorten the duration of sleep. So what is normal sleep? Well, there are two factors that control the need for sleep. The total quantity of sleep and the daily circadian rhythm of sleepiness and alertness. And it's well established that a person's circadian rhythms are strongly influenced by exposure to light. So for optimal daytime alertness, humans seem to require about eight hours of sleep in a 24 hour period. And you'll hear me saying over and over again that sleep deprivation causes very predictable problems like increased daytime sleepiness, but also can result in cognitive impairment, and nobody, nobody wants that. Under normal conditions, the circadian rhythms, pr they, they promote a daily cycle of nighttime sleep and daytime alertness. Keep in mind, we're not nocturnal animals. We're not raccoons. We're people. We're supposed to be asleep in the night and awake in the daytime. That's how we're hardwired. Um, it is normal to experience a kind of a what we used to call the postprandial dip. After you eat lunch, you kind of feel tired. Even if you don't eat lunch, you'll feel tired in the, in the mid-afternoon. That dip in alertness, um, which is so conducive to sleeping, to napping, is, is pretty common. Um, there are a lot of stages during the sleep period. There's Everybody's familiar with rapid eye movement or REM sleep. That's about 15 to 25% of the total amount of sleep, and that's associated with dreaming. Um, a lot of other things happen during REM sleep, such as the changeability of the heart rate, and blood pressure, and respiration. And then you have non-REM sleep, and that's also subdivided into stages. And these are stages of increasing depth. Um, the deepest non-REM sleep generally occurs in the early part of the night, and episodes of REM occur approximately every 90 minutes. 
Um, and these episodes tend to increase in duration as you go through the night. Older people have more fragmented sleep and they also have a shorter duration of stages three and four sleep that, that, uh, than those that occur in younger people. To give you a picture of what that looks like, these are hypnograms. These are graphical representations of the stages of sleep as a function of time. And if you look at the top one versus the lower one, you'll see the young adults kind of quickly, quickly fall asleep and they go into stage four and they have this nice pattern and eventually they wake up and they're well rested. Compare that to the older adult, you see it's very fragmented, they never get down to stage four and there's constant awakening going on, which explains why um, older folks often complain of, of sleep problems. So if you look at this picture, I'm gonna challenge you to think of what are you seeing in this picture? Um, I don't know if anybody wants to unmute and say what they think they're seeing in this picture, but I'll give you a few minutes if somebody wants to say what they think they're seeing here. I don't see anybody unmute. Oh, one person is unmuting. I see someone uh, watching television, eating on the couch. You see somebody eating in front of the television, right? right. What else do you see? Um, a wine glass. Wine glass. And she is, yeah, she's wearing glasses. Wearing glasses. Are you seeing an older woman? She's watching TV. People, watching TV with the wine glass and the food, right? So uh, I see when I look at that picture, a recipe for possible poor sleep. What's the problem here? Well, you can't see it, but I know that the clock on the top of the television is actually a quarter to midnight. So what? it's 11, oh 11 45 and she is watching TV and eating. So we who consume alcohol or caffeine within four to six hours of bedtime, um, you're gonna have a problem with sleep. Wine is also interesting and I'm gonna talk more about this specifically in a moment. Um, also is not a problem if you're not drinking it too late at night. We are overstimulated by, by television. You know, you want to wind down in the evening, not get stimulated. Eating before you want to go to bed, a large meal that is late in the evening is not a recipe for good sleep. Um, so she's watching television. Television emits light. All electronic devices emit the kind of light that interferes with sleep. She's got a glass of wine there, and she's eating a fairly significantly sized meal at 11, at 11.45 at night. So all of this spells poor sleep. So I wanna mention about caffeine and alcohol. Uh, caffeine can have an alerting effect for many hours. So if you're going to drink coffee late in the evening, be prepared to have some trouble with wakefulness. Uh, if you're drinking it early in the day, if you're somebody who wakes up and decides to have a cup of coffee because it wakes you up, you see, you see that it does. That's the point of, of caffeine-containing beverages, but you don't want to take it too late in the day. Now, alcohol is a slightly different problem. Alcohol is anybody who's ever watched somebody overindulge or they themselves knows that additionally, it, in, in, initially, alcohol sedates you makes you kind of fall asleep. The guy with the lampshade on his head in the corner at a party makes you go to sleep. But then what happens, it prevents deeper sleep later on and it increases arousals at night. So alcohol is a truly double-edged sword. I wanna mention some medical conditions, both acute and chronic, that can have an impact on the quality and duration of sleep. And, and the reasons can, can generally be grouped into the conditions that cause pain or conditions that require medications that interfere with sleep or conditions such as an enlarged prostate that cause men to awaken to use the bathroom multiple times in the night. Arthritis, the primary symptom of arthritis for many people is pain. And if it's kind of pain that keeps you awake, you can see where sleep is going to be disturbed. I mentioned about prostates already. Cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, pulmonary diseases all relate to the medications uh, that, that you take for these very often and they may all precipitate sleep disruptions, and I'll talk about meds in a minute. Um, and of course, pain 
of, of any kind and those neurodegenerative disorders that I mentioned before, like uh, Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease may also interfere with sleep. When it comes to medications, many medications can have a stimulating effect and therefore they cause sleep disruption. So if you think that your medications are interfering with sleep, discuss it with whomever it was who prescribed them. Do not stop taking medications on your own because you think they're interfering with sleep. As I like to say, and anybody who hears me speak knows that I always say a doctor who treats himself or herself has a fool for a patient. So don't be a doctor and treat yourself. You talk to the person who's prescribed meds. So here's a list of medications, some antidepressants, particularly selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac or Zoloft or Paxil or Lexapro or Celexa may interfere with sleep if you take them in the evening. So the answer is not to stop taking them, but to discuss with the doctor and maybe taking it at a different time of day. Decongestants and bronchodilators, those medications may also kind of rev you up unintentionally and keep you from, from sleeping comfortably. Again, the idea is not to not take them, it's to question whether you should be taking them before you wanna to go to sleep. Then there are certain drugs like antihypertensives, those are for blood pressure, um, that will actually make you sleepy. Things like beta blockers, if you've ever heard of metoprolol or atenolol, and many people are told to take those medications in the evening because they kind of make you sleepy. So you get two like bangs for your buck, and uh, not to take it at eight in the morning, but rather to take it in the evening. Uh, back to drugs that will interfere with sleep are things like corticosteroids, like prednisone. Why? Because they will keep you awake and they're great drugs. Corticosteroids have wonderful anti-inflammatory properties, but you may not want to take them at night. Diuretics, otherwise known as water pills, because they make you pee. That's what they do. So if you use a diuretic at night, that can promote repeated awakenings to go to the bathroom. So medications may be the cause of some sleep problems that people experience. And again, I repeat, do not stop medications on your own. Do not change your medications. Talk to whoever prescribed them to you. So if I could stop waking up more tired than when I go to bed the night before, that'd be great. Uh, I thought this was pretty amusing. So after talking about all the problems associated with sleep, I'd like to offer you some practical suggestions for dealing with sleep disturbances and talk about some proper sleep habits. So what are some good ways to promote good sleep through proper sleep hygiene? First of all, waking up the same time every day. A good night's sleep actually starts in the morning, which sounds crazy, but it's true. You can synchronize your body's clock by being consistent with your wake-up time and the time you go to sleep. And soon you won't even need an alarm clock because if you go to sleep at the correct time at night, then you should be able to get up seven or eight hours later after sleeping very well. But the kicker is, of course, what is the correct time to go to sleep? And actually the correct time to go to sleep is within an hour of when you first start to be tired. And for many people, this is unacceptable. What am I, a baby? I'm not going to sleep that early. But we're actually meant to go to sleep when it gets dark, just as we're meant to get up when it's light. So consider going to sleep earlier than you normally do, as long as you're, you're tired. Uh, don't force yourself to go to sleep if you're not tired because then you'll just toss and turn. Letting the sunshine in means exposing yourself to bright light within 15 minutes of waking up, get your brain, your body moving. Um, we know that sunlight activates the brain. So the minute your eyes go open, the light shoots down the optic nerve and a bunch of hormones that regulate everything from growth to eating, to sleeping, to thinking, to remembering, all of those get stimulated, all from, from light. So let the sunshine in, open those, those curtains. Exercise, and it doesn't take much. Get some exercise every day, outdoor if possible, if you can do it, indoors if you can't. Um, we know that people who are exercisers fall asleep more easily. We know that they also sleep longer than people who don't. Why? Because you've used your body. Your body is tired. It wants to rest. 
Uh, one study out of the University of Arizona showed that walking six blocks at a normal pace during the daytime increased sleep at night. And this was, you know, a, a statistical improvement that was, uh, was uh, important. It wasn't just like a minute or two. Um, scientists think that exercise can help set your biological clock into that consistent sleep-wake pattern that we, we are all seeking. Um, we also know that, that exercise can help boost serotonin, which is a neurochemical that, among other things, also encourages sleep. Um, but make sure that if you're going to exercise, at least two hours before bed, complete your exercise any later, and you're going to energize yourself right into insomnia, which is not what you want to do. Um, in the hour before you think you'll be going to sleep, let's say your bedtime is usually somewhere around 10. In that hour before, you wind down. You don't do any chores. You don't do anything exciting. No loud music. Don't watch the nighttime news. That'll keep you from sleeping. Um, don't play with computers. You know, the light from the monitor is another one of those electronic lights. Don't play with your cell phone. Just wind down. Um, and you don't want to totally reset your wake and sleep cycles by fooling around with electronic devices before you want to go to sleep. Um, avoiding excessive wakeful time in bed. There are two kinds of excessive wake time in bed. The first, as I said, when you go to bed and you simply can't fall asleep because you're not tired yet, so you want to avoid that. But sometimes you are tired and you lay there and you can't fall asleep and you get more and more frustrated that you can't sleep. So you start counting sheep and you're doing math problems in foreign languages and none of this actually works. It actually wakes most people up and increases your frustration, which can lead your body to produce stress hormones, which will continue to keep you awake and alert, which is not what you're after. The second type occurs when you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't fall back asleep. Many people get up and go to the bathroom and come back and they fall right back asleep. Other people wake up and simply can't fall back asleep. And if you've been laying there for half an hour and you still don't fall back asleep, many um, experts recommend that you leave the bed and the room you can try to read a book, a real book, not an electronic book, a real one with paper pages. Uh, moving around, reading a book can help you get sleepy again, and that's when you return to the bed um, and not before. You can make sure that you are sleeping in a sleep-friendly environment. You know, we're not hibernating bears, but our bodies really do react to temperature, and a cooler temperature signals the body that it's time to sleep. And if you ever notice this in a cool room, you tend to sleep better. If you don't believe me, think about the summer when you have the air conditioner set to cool and people, oh, I slept like a log. It's better to be in a cool room. And that's why God created pajamas and, you know, blankets. Um, but your the ambient air around your head should be cool somewhere around 65 degrees. Uh, some people find that taking a warm bath helps. Now, Actually, a warm bath causes your temperature to go up while you're in the bath, obviously. But the response of your body to heat is to drop your internal temperature, and that also encourages sleep. Shutting the drapes is the opposite of letting the sunshine in. You should sleep in the dark as much as possible. Even street lights and a full moon can bother you in terms of sleeping. Uh, you can use a nightlight in the bathroom if you need one, if you're somebody who gets up and goes to the bathroom. But you don't want bright light exposures because bright lights tell your brain that it's time to wake up. So you want to avoid that as much as possible at night. Turning down the volume, well, if there's traffic or, or neighbors or noise that you simply can't control, you can get one of these um, white noise machines that some people like. You can put on the hum of a, of a fan or an air conditioner. Some people actually have uh, their radios on between stations, and there's kind of a very low white noise kind of sound between stations. Some people think classical music helps. Uh, there have been some studies that show that this kind of music can increase the duration and the, the depth of sleep. Um, but if you're going to use any kind of radio or sometimes device, make sure you have an automatic shutoff. You don't want it to be going on and on after you do fall asleep and potentially wake you up again. Um, there has been some work done on socks, putting on socks. 
I don't have a real explanation for it, but there's some re research that shows that wearing socks to bed helps you sleep. It may have something to do with warming the most distal part of your body, which are your feet, um, and that makes your body temperature internally drop. It's not clear why, but the kind of socks you choose is also important. It shouldn't be binding. It should be something that's non-binding, a natural material, and not a synthetic material that will just make your, your feet sweat. If you have a clock, turn the clock away. If you have a clock that has a digital readout, um, the light from that can be enough to jolt you out of sleep. And of course, some people will spend half a night looking at the clock and watching it's 2 o'clock, it's 2.20, it's 2.40, it's 3 o'clock, and this can go on for hours. So you want to turn the clock away. When you think about it, if you have an alarm set, it's going to go off whether you're looking at the readout or not. In terms of changing your position, uh, the best position to sleep on is on your side with your knees bent and maybe a pillow between your legs, as some people have found, because that takes the stress off your back. But if you like sleeping on your back, you know, put a pillow under your knees. That can also help take the stress off your back. But sleeping on the stomach isn't really recommended because that causes strain on the lower back and it may actually boomerang on you when you have back pain. Um, so that helps make your environment sleep friendly. If there's any plant people out there, um, consider plants to improve your bedtime environment. There are a number of plants that may help, uh, many more that are not on this list, like uh, aloe vera, but uh, these, this particular list has been studied with some interesting results. Uh, jasmine, if you're familiar with the scent of jasmine, jasmine actually um, elicits the same molecular mechanism that's triggered by barbiturates, it suits it eases anxiety, it promotes sleep. So if you like the scent of jasmine, jasmine plant can work for you. Uh, English ivy actually has been studied by NASA, uh, but keep in mind that this kind of plant, an English ivy plant, is, is toxic for kids and pets if they, if they eat it, so you want to keep it out of the way of children and pets. Uh, gardenia, people think of it as a corsage flower. Um, but it has a substantial sedative effect. Um, some say that it could be as potent as Valium, and you don't even need the drug. You just have the, the gardenia. Lavender, many people are familiar with lavender. They spray it on their bedding, and, and they use the scent to make them, you know, be calm. Uh, it also reduces anxiety, lavender. And studies have shown that it might actually cause cortisol levels to drop, which, which promotes being calm. And finally, there's Boston fern, which is an interesting plant because this plant actually takes up fat formaldehyde. And I know some of you may be saying formaldehyde, you know, I don't work in a mortuary. Why would there be formaldehyde around? Well, newer housing, the materials used to build newer housing also sometimes um, they actually give off formaldehyde. And so it's in the air, even though you're not aware of it, but Boston ferns actually suck it up. So it's uh, kind of a nice, uh, a nice double benefit from a, a pretty plant. Um, I like this slide, even though it's a trifle busy. Um, it basically summarizes the top of the slide, the bottom of the slide, what are the good things that help you sleep and the things that keep you awake. So what kind of things help you sleep? We talked about going to bed and getting up at the same time every day. We talked about not watching TV before bed. I want to mention the importance of staying hydrated. That means drinking water. Most of us walk around chronically dehydrated. People don't like water or they're worried they're going to pee too much, whatever the problem is. But if you stay well hydrated during the day, you're much less likely to get up at night. And when we get up at night, sometimes we think we're hungry. We're actually thirsty, but we don't differentiate well between hunger and thirst in the middle of the night. So you get up and you eat something and you're back where you started from because eating a heavy meal before you want to go to sleep, your gut wants to digest. It doesn't want to sleep. So much better to stay well hydrated and not wake up looking for food in the middle of the night. Um, doing relaxation exercises before bed. Many of you may be familiar with breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth, uh, which elicits a relaxation reflex, which you really can't resist. Some people do 
um, progressive muscle relaxation. You start at your toes and you work your way up and you contract release muscle groups and be way before you get to your head, you're usually falling asleep or asleep um, because you're so relaxed. Spending time in the daylight, we need light. We need light to trigger us to know that it's time to be awake and alert. And we also need vitamin D and you get that from daylight. We've sent, spent decades demonizing the sun. The sun is actually very necessary and healthy for us. I know you should get suntanned, but you should get some natural sunlight um, every day, ideally. Reading a book in bed. Many people have trained themselves. They read a few pages of a book and they're out like a light. So that can be a nice, a nice benefit of reading. Uh, a light dinner. Not too late. Remember, you don't want to be eating at a quarter to 11 at night in front of the television set. A light dinner and not too late. The rule of thumb is eat breakfast like a king and lunch like a prince and dinner like a pauper. You don't want to have too much food in there trying to be digested. If you look at the bottom of the slide, what keeps you awake? Well, coffee and chocolates after dinner for obvious reasons. They both contain caffeine. Um, so if you want to enjoy chocolates or coffee, make sure that it's way before um, the evening. A hot bedroom with no air circulation. Remember, 65 degrees is, is ideal, and many people don't like that idea, particularly as the weather gets colder, but it's actually better to sleep in. Going to bed too early when you're not tired. Well, I ran out of things to do. I think I'll go to sleep. Well, if you're not tired, you're not going to likely to fall asleep. Uh, keep in mind, by the way, that if you're the person who your head put, gets on the pillow and you immediately drop off to sleep, do not congratulate yourself. That's a sign of being sleep deprived because it usually takes a few minutes to fall asleep. If you're hitting the pillow and you're out like a light, you are sleep deprived by definition. Um, poor quality bedding. I don't have any you know, stock in a bedding company, but if you sleep on bedding that's made of natural fibers, high quality bedding, you're much more likely to sleep well because natural fibers will wick away the perspiration that everybody emits during during the night. If you sleep on synthetics, it's very clammy and uncomfortable. So good quality bedding. Um, staying indoors all day and doing no exercise. Remember, you need light and you need to exercise. Even if your exercise is walking around the block, if you are not comfortable going outside for exercise, you can exercise indoors. You can exercise by walking around a mall when things go back to normal, but you do need to get some natural light. Lying in bed for hours, getting annoyed that you can't sleep. That's when frustration hits and you start spilling out those stress hormones. You don't wanna go there. Worrying about things happening in the future. This is a big favorite. When it's dark and it's quiet, people start thinking and they're thinking about things happening in the future, even if they're things that they can't do anything about. This is when they start thinking. Now, if you do happen to wake up at night and you remember that you really did forget to do something important, oh my God, I forgot to pay the electric bill. If it really will make you feel better, you can get out of bed, write the check and go back to sleep. I personally recommend keeping a pad and a pencil next to the bed. And if you think of something that you forgot to do, scribble it on the pad and let it go. It's really important not to waste your time worrying about things that you can't do anything about in the middle of the night. World peace, world hunger. There's nothing you can do about it in the middle of the night. And people have real problems that keep them up. And there's a lot of people who believe in things like guided imagery. If you know what guided imagery is, it's a technique where you basically think and focus your mind in a way that it lets you push certain things away that you don't want to think about and replace them with other thoughts. Like you have problems, you put them on a little boat and you see the little boat going down the river. And it's, it's a very nice technique for those who, um, who like it. Um, using a computer just before bedtime or any electronic device is a no-no. I know people who sleep with their cell phones next to their faces. They're so worried that they're gonna miss something important. Uh, you can put the cell phone under the bed if you really need to have it nearby, but you shouldn't be looking at the cell phone or any electronic device um, during the night. I wanna mention a word about foods that may help you sleep. Um, most people are aware that carbohydrate-based meals um, actually can help you sleep. And that means foods like whole grains, bread, 
rice, pasta, sugars, dairy, fruits, certain vegetables. Why? Well, carbohydrate-based meals increase blood levels of tryptophan, which is used by the body to manufacture serotonin. I mentioned it before. It's a, a calming neurotransmitter. Um, if you, you know, like fruits and some vegetables like potatoes, peas, corn, parsnips, yams, legumes, all these things can, can help you in terms of sleep. Don't fall into the trap of eating very rich ice cream. It is dairy, but it has a lot of fat. It takes a while to digest, which will keep your digestive system going when you go to sleep, and that can interfere with sleep. But warm milk at bedtime can really help you get to sleep. And it sounds like an old wives' tale, but it's it's not. Um, it has tryptophan in it, and among other things, it helps settle the stomach. And some people find that whole ritual of drinking that glass of milk can help them calm down and fall asleep more easily. Actually, the milk doesn't have to be warm because even cold milk has tryptophan in it, but warm milk is a little bit more soothing. Um, the last bullet on this slide refers to tart cherry juice. And the story of how I learned about tart cherry juice, I was giving actually a talk in a library, not this library, and a man raised his hand, this goes back a number of years, and said to me, you know, I always drink cherry juice and that makes me sleepy. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And I didn't know what he was talking about, but I went back to my office and I started looking around for information about tart cherry juice. And I found that tart cherry juice is high in melatonin, which is another hormone that uh, regulates the body's sleep and wake cycles. Um, and there have been studies, and you can find these online if you're interested, that people who drink tart cherry juice um, had about, you know, 17 minutes or so more sleep than when they did not drink the cherry juice. But like all good things, there is a catch. Cherry juice is fairly caloric, like most fruit juices. So if you try the cherry juice pathway, you may want to cut back on calories that are better elsewhere. Um, for those who like the idea of tryptophan, um, and that it helps to induce sleep. Think about things like turkey. Yes, you know, Thanksgiving, sleeping, people think it's because they ate too much. It's really because they're eating turkey. Um, it does help to induce sleep. Uh, tryptophan, if you're not familiar with it, it's um, an essential amino acid, and we need it for growth and development, and it helps to produce uh, niacin and to create serotonin, as I said. Uh, this is a list of, of some foods that contain tryptophan. So you're like almonds, chickpeas, uh, eggs, cheese, milk, oats, all of these can be, can be helpful in terms of food. Just don't overindulge, especially before you want to go to sleep. So you've done everything right and you still can't sleep. What are you supposed to do about it? Well, you've tried everything and the quantity or the quality of your sleep isn't where you want to be. So first of all, consult with your doctor. Many doctors don't ask people about sleep. If they don't bring it up, they don't ask. So bring it up and talk to the doctor. If your doctor happens to be somebody who deals with sleep problems, they may be able to kind of work with you on whatever your sleep problem turns out to be. Or they may simply refer you to a sleep specialist. That's somebody whose life is, is uh, devoted to dealing with, with sleep problems. Um, most people do sleep studies in a dedicated lab, but some people now do sleep studies at home. And the point of this is to get actually a tracing of what their sleep is like. And then the specialist can figure out whether somebody has a problem like sleep apnea, which is a problem that can be dealt with or if there's something else going on in terms of their sleep, or if nothing is going on and it's all related to sleep hygiene. Uh, you might want to keep a sleep diary. Uh, sleep diaries are used to show how much you're really sleeping. So write down, you know, when you go to bed, when you wake up, how many hours you think you actually are sleeping. Um, and a specialist will use this information to see whether or not there is a problem underlying your sleep issues or not. So that can be helpful. Um, CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy is um, a technique that concentrates on retraining 
the brain to change behavior. Um, if that's what's keeping you from sleeping, uh, CBT uh, is usually done by non-physicians. It's psychologists, um, other people who are trained in this. In this, it does not involve the use of medication. Uh, but CBT has been very helpful in helping uh, people who have a host of, of habits or problems that they'd like to solve, um, and it really it really can be helpful. Uh, the studies suggest that CBT is actually better than sleeping pills at helping people get to sleep faster. And finally, last and least, my least favorite is medicine. There are medications um, that can be used and they can be and should be used carefully and under a doctor's supervision. Uh, I had a person once came to one of my talks and told me that she was on Ambien and had been on Ambien for 22 years. And I said, 22 years? How did you get the doctor to give you Ambien for 22 years? And she said, oh, I have lots of doctors. Um, and I was kind of amazed, but she had managed it at this point. She really couldn't sleep without her Ambien. Uh, there's a downside to medication. The sleep that you get is not the same quality as the sleep you get naturally. <clears throat> but there definitely are times and places to use um, sleep medication. Usually if people are in a bereavement or some situation where they must sleep and they can't sleep and the medications are usually prescribed for a short period of time, and again, under, under supervision. So at this point, I'm going to ask if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Dr. Stern. I'm just going to end the recording here so we can open it up to questions.